can change the world. Do you world. care about dirt? Well, you better, and we're going to find out all about it with Dr. David Montgomery from the University of Washington. Uh, welcome, Dr. Montgomery. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So is it dirt that we're talking about? Well, it's soil. You know, uh, soil and dirt are uh, different things in a sense. Dirt is soil where you don't want it. It's soil that's out of place. And soil is what we really need to support our civilization. And dirt's what we've turned a lot of it into on some of our farms. All right, well, let's go halfway around the world then. How many bombs does it take for Syria to be so desolate? Is that what caused their economic and e uh, ecological problems? No, the roots go long before bombs were even invented. They go back to the loss of the soil in the Roman era, actually, across much of the Middle East and North Africa. It was degradation and erosion of their topsoil that really made those regions the kind of desolate areas that we see and know today. Uh, you, we can kind of think of the Garden of Eden as being part of sort of the lower Mesopotamia. And we don't see that today in what we see there. It's a, a desolate region. And this is a long-term legacy of soil degradation and losing the fertil fertility and productive capacity of their land. You've just uh, recently released your third book now. It's uh, Growing a Revolution. And you're talking about how important understanding soil fertility is and just our everyday lives. You know, the, the global problem of soil degradation is one of the big underappreciated environmental crises that humanity faces today. And it filters right down to, you know, what's in what we eat, because the connections between how farmers actually practice agriculture on the land not only affect the ability of soil to feed people in the future, the problem that Syria ran into long ago, but it also impacts the quality of the food that we're eating today and our ability and will affect the ability to feed the future as well. But that's in part because of a growing population and if we keep degrading our farmland, those two curves are gonna interact in a pretty bad way at some point. Now, uh, you are a, a PhD geologist, right? Yeah, I got into thinking about soil from, from the, the bottom side of it, from <laughs> how you turn rocks into soil. Yeah. Um, and so I'm, I'm technically a geomorphologist, which is a fancy way of saying a topographer, someone who studies physical geography, what shapes the surface of the earth. And if you think about what's been doing that for the last 10,000 years, since the dawn of agriculture, people have really started to take the front seat in how we're changing the surface of the world. And the thesis of my first book, Dirt, was mm -hmm. really that that's affected the course and fate and longevity of human societies. Dirt, the erosion of civilizations. You're also co-author on a second book about the hidden half of nature. And then this one, of course, is Growing a Revolution. Yeah, so what is, is the current state of, uh, of soil uh, across the world and in the United States? Well, if you, if you look at the world sort of as a whole, and you look at how much of the world's topsoil and our, our, our ability to actually feed ourselves through the use of the land, we've lost somewhere between a third and a half of the topsoil that we had at the close of the Ice Age. That's kind of squandering our natural endowment of, of, of biological capital, of our ability to, to grow food. You look at the United States, we've burned through about half the organic matter in the soils that were here when Europeans first colonized the U.S. We've eroded through, the, you know, anywhere from about a third to a half of our topsoil across the nation uh, on average. But there's places that you can go where farmers are actually farming the subsoil. The topsoil is gone across a pretty big swath of the southeast. That topsoil, you go there and it's just not there anymore. Well, as a soil interested geologist, I would hesitate to call myself a soil scientist since my training is really about the rocks below, but I can know how to read soils, can interpret them, and you can go there and go, there used to be topsoil but there's not anymore, they're farming the subsoil. And the reservoir of fertility is in that topsoil. And so the real problem of soil erosion is that you're taking the most fertile stuff off the top and you can only do that for so long before it really impacts your ability to keep growing food. And I love having you on because you make this statement in your, in your latest book. You says, I find cause for optimism, for it turns out we can change the practice of agriculture in ways that leave soil better off instead of degrading it. Is that true? Yes, it is. And that's, that's really the message of the new book, Growing a Revolution. Because you know, in the first book, I looked back at the, the history of societies that had degraded their land and looked at how people that didn't take care of their soil, the soil couldn't take care of their descendants. But if you look around the world today at farmers who are practicing regenerative agriculture, mm -hmm. sort of a whole different philosophy and style of farming that flips some of the key principles of modern agriculture on its head, um, they're rebuilding the fertility of their land while maintaining their harvests, while, while intensively farming. And if we could actually figure out how to build soil fertility as a consequence of large-scale intensive agriculture, 
it's really would be a game changer in terms of the course and fate of, of our current civilization. And I'm really happy to say that the farmers that I visited have demonstrated that it's not a pipe dream. They're doing it. They've done it. I mean, it took a shovel to their fields, looked at their neighbors' fields. The change and transformation is actually pretty incredible. Well, you actually say this as well in the book. It says, what if I told you there was a relatively simple, cost-effective way to help feed the world, reduce pollution, pull carbon from the atmosphere, protect biodiversity, and make farmers more money? Can you say that? Oh, I did. <laughs> and, and Are yes. you the miracle man that can make this happen? Well, no, but I, but I am the guy who went around and visited farmers who are actually doing it. So I'm sort of reporting what they've actually done. And if you look at uh, the benefits that could flow from restoring fertility to our soils, mm -hmm. the, you just rattled off the list that um, it would help with. Um, because the key thing to rebuilding soil fertility is rebuilding soil organic matter. And there's another word for that, carbon. And so mm -hmm. if we can put carbon out of the atmosphere, use plants through photosynthesis, use our crops and, and our cover crops to take carbon out of the atmosphere and put it back in the soil and still maintain our, the harvest that we've been getting off of it and do it using less fertilizer, using less diesel, um, using less pesticide, um, that would reduce off-site uh, pollution. It could it help enhance on-farm biodiversity in a quarter of the world's continental areas are now in agriculture. So the future of biodiversity is in great part a future of agriculture. What we do on our farms is gonna shape an awful lot of the world's biodiversity. And the most, the part that really made me an optimist about this new style of farming, was this more profitable for farmers? Because if you look at what's happened on farms in the developed world since the Second World War, farmers have gotten really good at growing very few things. They've specialized in things like corn and soy. And the commodity price, the price they get for ha their harvest today, are quite low for those things that they're so good at growing because they grow so much of them and the old supply and demand uh, mm -hmm. comes into play there. But what's happened to the, the major inputs that modern farming rely on to actually generate those harvests today? Those prices, diesel, um, fertilizers, specialized seeds, they've all gone through the roof. And who's been squeezed in the middle? The farmers. Yeah. So a big part of what squeezed family farms out of agriculture in the developed world or made them go big or get out has been those sort of two curves of falling commodity prices, rising input prices. So if you could figure out a way to maintain your harvest to grow just as much but use less of those inputs, it's a recipe for better farm profitability because your income can remain the same, your expenses go down, and that's a good recipe for the farmers. Well, it sounds like, as you say in the book, that it really is a political problem rather than uh, uh, an agronomist problem. Well, it, it's partly a political problem, but it, it's also a problem in terms of awareness and in terms of thinking, how we look at the soil. Because we've tended to look at the soil over the last you know, 100, 150 years since the rise of mechanization and large-scale fertilizer and then later agrochemical um, uh, pesticide use. We tend to look at the soil as something that'll hold the plants up when we add all the stuff that they need to grow. And what we've kind of lost in our focus on the chemistry and the physics of the problems of agronomy is the role that the biology played, and particularly the microbial biology. All those bacteria and fungi in the soil that can, a can actually help unlock the mineral nutrients out of the, the rock particles, the soil particles, and get them into biological circulation. So what you're saying <laughs> is that the microbes are things that we actually need to keep. Yes. And that's what, that's been, there's been a total revolution in thought in the last 20, 30 years about the role of microbes, not only in soil fertility, but also in maintaining our own health. And that was the focus of that Hidden Half of Nature book um, in terms of looking at how we need to rethink our relationship to microbial life. Because there's certainly pests and pathogens out there and nobody wants to get a microbially caused disease. And that's mm -hmm. one of the great advantages of you know, public health and sanitation, things that have developed in the last 150 years that have really helped cut down on the incidence of infectious diseases. But it turns out that you know, most microbes, whether in the soil or living on or in us, are actually either benign or good for us in the sense that they're actually doing things that promote the health of our crops or the health of ourselves. And the style of agriculture that we really went way down the road on in the 20th century doesn't help the beneficial communities of microbes that are in the soil. Okay, let me simplify this. Do, uh, does our agrochemicals, our, our chemical fertilizers, do they kill microbes? Well, they change the, the distribution of the organisms living it. So they change the community that is living in the soil. 
and they tend to do it in ways that don't benefit the, the resilience and ability of that crop to get things that it needs out of the soil because the, the, the microbial partners the crops have, the mycorrhizal fungi, certain bacteria in the soil, will help get micronutrient elements out of the mineral particles, things the plant needs to grow and benefit its own and support its own health, things that make it resilient so it can resist those pests and pathogens that are out there. Mm -hmm. And what really intensive agrochemical use has done is it's greatly reduced the amount of organic matter in the soil. And you can think of that as food for those microbes. Uh, you know, they need to eat and they, then they will do things. They'll make, they'll turn the organic matter that they consume in the soil into metabolites, their waste products, things that the plants mm -hmm. can then take up. They're the engine that really circulates nutrients. And, and it's that recycling of dead things, of organic matter, things that were once alive, mm -hmm. back into things plants can take up that really drives the great wheel of life that keeps us from being either buried under our, our dead things or starved of nutrients in the soil. But I don't understand, Dr. Montgomery, are we not producing more food per acre now through our modern farming methods than that has ever been? Um, what we're able to do through our modern farming methods is produce more of particular crops per acre. But if you look, so if you look at just corn, you look at just soy, look mm -hmm. at just wheat, Modern farming has been very good at maximizing the yields we can get per hectare off of that. If you look at the total amount of food that's grown per hectare though, the way to actually generate the most food, the most calories, are on small, diver small scale diversified farms where you're growing more than one thing at a time. So our methods uh, of modern agriculture have been really good at producing high yields of a few crops in large scale monocultures. But that's also helped to degrade the long term fertility of the soil, which means that to keep producing those kind of yields with the kind of methods that we have now, we're using a lot of diesel, we're using a lot more of those chemicals, and there have been sort of add-on effects, if you will. And what, so what I was really excited about with farmers around the world that I visited that were practicing this new regenerative agriculture mm -hmm. is they were able to maintain their yields while using far less of those chemical inputs. Really? Yes, and that's a recipe for essentially getting around that dilemma that you know, do we need to practice large-scale industrialized monocultures with, with lots of chemical use to feed the world? And if we can actually produce the same amount of food with less of those inputs, it basically answers the question without even having to go at the fact that today you know, we, have, we waste enough food to actually feed the number of people that we expect to see coming in the next you know, 20, 30 years. Yeah. So there's, there's food distribution and equity problems. Uh, we, we grow enough food at present to feed the world if we, divide, if we got it to everybody. But not all of the food that's grown actually gets eaten by somebody. Something like yeah. a third of it is wasted. But agriculture is more, uh, a lot more than just about food. Agriculture is about money. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. And so the, the question then, I, th I think when we're talking about money and we're talking about farms and farmers is, let's define farmer. Who are we talking about here? Are we talking about the guy in the plaid shirt and you know he's got the pitchfork in his hand? Or are we talking about some big giant uh, combine that's driven by the farmer? Well, you know, they're not always different because there are family farms that are huge that are using large technologies, large combines. But if you look at the, um, you know, who's growing food to feed the world today? Something like 80% of the world's food is grown on family farms. But family farms range from small subsistence farms in the developing world where you're just feeding the farmer's family to really large operations in North America that are producing commodity crops for the global market, but they're still run by a family. Hmm. And so there's, there's a pretty wide range of sort of who is a farmer today. I like to think of a definition of a farmer as someone who's capturing solar energy and turning it into food to feed people. Because um, <laughs> that's essentially what they all have in common. Yeah, um, Big money, bad soil. You talk about that as well. And I'm actually kind of wondering, as I was reading the, the last book, um, I wondered, is agriculture turning into an extractive industry like mining and oil drilling? Um, the short answer is yes, but it could also make the case that it has long has been. Because if you look at, uh, you know, get back to your example of Syria um, at, the start, at the start of the program, mm -hmm. um, you can make a pretty good case that organic agriculture was a major destructive impact on Syria, North Africa, the Roman Empire, classical Greece. There's a whole list that I go through in the book. So if we eat, we're doing bad things? No, it's all about how we grow our food. So if we grow our food in ways that cause erosion, that cause degradation of the soil, you're kind of running out the clock on people's ability to eat in the future. 
And what I was uh, really fascinated by with these farmers today that are practicing regenerative um, agriculture is they've figured out a recipe to actually get around the problem of soil erosion and get around the problem of soil degradation and just completely turn the historical pattern of mining fertility that modern conventional agriculture is still engaging in. They figured a way to turn that around and build fertility as a consequence of intensive farming. So and what you're talking about is, is building up the quality of the soil at the same time that they're growing more food. Exactly, exactly. What did you find? Who's, who is being successful at this? Well, you know, there's people in various places around the world who are being quite successful at this. And I, I went and started on a six month trip to go visit farmers in different parts of the world to actually uh, investigate. Because, you know, as a geologist, I'm not the right person to basically tell a farmer how to farm on their piece of land. They know their land better than I do. Uh, they know uh, it, far more about what they're trying to do. So I went to farmers who had been successful at restoring fertility to their land and re rebuilding the fertility of their soil. And you know, I started off going to some large farms in South Dakota where they had um, gone to no-till farming, um, which is a farming where you're not using a plow. And the basic villain in the long history of agriculture in terms of soil degradation has mostly been the plow. And really? Yeah. So how do you turn the soil though? Yeah, well, you don't. You don't? <laughs> you don't. You have to think differently about it. You okay. change, and this is where this sort of um, you know, a revolution in thought about the soil uh, underlies these new agricultural practices that can get us out of this, this ancient dilemma of the more food we grow, the less people in the future will be able to eat. Um, you know, and that's just something we absolutely have to solve as mm -hmm. a global society. What, what the, the recipe that essentially this, this farmers from large farms in South Dakota to subsistence farmers in Africa that I visited, the common elements were don't disturb the soil. So stop plowing, ditch the plow. Mm. Cover up, grow cover crops so you don't leave the ground surface cover uh, uh, vulnerable to wind or rain that could remove the soil faster than it can mm -hmm. be rebuilt. Cover crops, what do you mean by that? Uh, it basically, a, always keep the ground covered. So if you think about the image of a freshly plowed field, there's nothing green on it. You know, you've, no, tur you've turned the soil over, right. you've got dirt all over the surface. Yeah, you know, bare soil everywhere. Um, under no-till farming, you don't um, disturb the soil to that extent, but you also want to keep the ground covered with something green, something living, a living plant. And so a cover crop is a crop that you would grow in between the crops you're growing to sell. Um, and it could grow either in between in space, sort of in between, say, your rows of corn, or between the harvest, so after you grow corn, you plant some other crop uh, before your next harvest. You just don't leave the field uh, uncovered. Keep something green on it at all times, a living plant. So let's let's say that you you've got um, six acres, you know, small small farm. Uh, but for six acres, you can not only feed your family, but you could probably sell a little bit too. On two acres of it, you've got crop A that's going to make you money. On two more acres, you've got crop B that might make you money, and two more acres where you've got a cover crop on it. Is that crop diversity? Is that what we're well, talking that, about? That's one way to do it. Um, one way to do it is in the same field have multiple crops. And this is what the subsistence farmers in Africa that I visited were doing. They would have up to six or eight crops in the same field at the same time. Really? So that, you know, one would be low on the ground, one would be a little higher, and then at the top they'd have plantains growing as sort of a, a, a canopy crop. And so if the soil's good enough, it can support three crops at the same time? Oh yeah, and, and the trick is, is to actually be building enough organic matter in the soil. So you're not exporting all the vegetable matter off of the field. So many cover crops will essentially be in the parlance of agronomy terminated or killed and left to rot on site. And in, in the developed world, a lot of farmers do that with herbicides. Some do it with, um, uh, with something called a crop roller where you basically crush the crop in place and turn it into a mulch. So a cover crop is not for export off the fields. It's for building up the organic matter in the fields. And if you think about it as essentially a biological pump where you're basically using the roots of those plants to get mineral elements out of the soil, bring them up from the subsoil into the topsoil, then you kill that plant, let it rot. All that stuff, all those elements that they pulled out of the soil are then in biological circulation because that, as that plant decays and becomes organic matter and the microbes start chewing on it and turning it into their waste products, those can be taken up by plants as nutrients. But can I do it better and faster by putting some agrochemicals on it? Um, you could do it faster. I'm not sure you could do it uh, better um, in the sense of how do you define better? And in, in my sort of view as a geologist, better means you can keep doing it for a long time. 
And what we've found with the use of a lot of chemical fertilizers is that you can get a, um, a burst of fertility out of the ground because it will, they will actually use a lot of nitrogen on the field, for example. Mm -hmm. It will stimulate the microbial activity to break down that organic matter and get those nutrients into the plants now, but you've drawn down the bank account. You've drawn down the reservoir to keep dribbling out and feed over subsequent years. Mm -hmm. So what I think the real key is, is you've got to be able to use the biology that's in the ground to get more of those uh, mineral elements out of the soil particles and into circulation. How about chemical pesticides? I mean, if I've got bugs eating my plants and I'm a farmer and I, I gotta get rid of those bugs, so I'm gonna spray them with something, glyphosate or something. Well, glyphosate's an herbicide, so it's used to control weeds, but there's lots of other oh. uh, pesticides that are used to actually can try and control insects. But one of the, the beneficial things you see from uh, restoring um, the life in the soil and fertility of the soil is it actually helps the plant's immune system, its defensive systems. And if we grow plants in ways where they're not uh, partially challenged or they're not um, exposed to the full sort of suite of organisms in the soil, their defenses go down and they become vulnerable to pests and pathogens. So one of the things that we saw in the developed world is after the introduction of widespread fertilizer use, the need for pesticides went up. And one of the first persons to recognize sort of the, the inverse piece of that was a guy named Sir Albert Howard, who was uh, an imperial economic botany, botanist for uh, England in, in India in the early 20th century. And he went there to try and help um, the plantation owners there figure out how to combat pests and pathogens. And what he observed early on was that the native farmers didn't really have pest problems and pathogen problems. They were growing food on really fertile soil because they had very intensive composting. They were returning organic matter to their land. And essentially, they were feeding their soil and feeding their microbial life with, with a lot of compost. And they didn't have the same problems that the farmers that he was tasked with trying to help had. And so he started to figure out, oh, maybe if we develop composting methods for large plantations, uh, it would be a way to actually help address the pest and pathogen problem. And there's farmers today who are doing that. There's a gentleman named Jonathan Lundgren in South Dakota who has a farm, Blue Dasher Farm, that mm -hmm. is, a, he's really doing, uh, you know, <clears throat> modern scientific research on why that works. And it turns out that if you apply a broad spectrum insecticide to a field, you're not just killing those pests, you're killing everything that eats those pests. And, you know, there's something like 1,200 beneficial organisms in a, um, in a field for every one pest that you're killing. So insecticides, and sort of in my view, are sort of a useful tool if you already have an infestation and you need to save your crop. Um, but if you're thinking about how to make your crop resilient to pests, it's not to use a lot of fertilizer and pesticide. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. to restore fertility to the soil and restore resilience to your crop. What I'm not hearing from you today and what I did not read in the book is the GMO or non-GMO debate. You seem to not necessarily avoid it, but that it, it's not the issue. <laughs> yeah, you know, the, there's a subsection in, in the, the new book that's called the GMO Sideshow. And it, it's sort of a, short, a short, short section where I basically argue that, you know, the, that's a, a argument worth having, but it's not the one I wanted to focus on for the book because the practices, this, this suite of ditching the plow, covering up with cover crops, and growing a diversity of crops, the third mm -hmm. element of this trilogy of, or this, this troika of things that really help rebuild fertility of the soil, you can do that on a conventional farm, you can do it on an organic farm, you can do it with GMO crops or not. And the, the thing that made me really um, impressed with the potential for this kind of uh, this shift in philosophy to adopt those principles and change our practices of farming uh, is it can rebuild soil fertility sort of across the board and so a lot most of the farmers I visited were conventional farmers some were growing uh, GMO crops some were not um, but they all found that they could greatly reduce their use of diesel, their use of fertilizer and their use of pesticides by adopting these three simple principles and their profits went up as yeah. a consequence, because they were spending less on those inputs. And so I think, I think the GMO, non-GMO argument is, is a, a good one to have, and the issue of glyphosate use and whether that has any place in our food supply is a really important issue. Uh, and one of the things that glyphosate um, seems to do is change the microbial composition in the soil, and there's evidence that it also um, has an impact on the gut biota of livestock. There's some um, yeah. studies that have come out of Europe. 
Um, but that's a whole different issue. You actually had just kind of touched on it, though, the quick recipe for a healthy soil, uh, organic matter, manure, and other plants, uh, cover crops, and a diverse cropping system. And you yep, found that. It. You found that from your talk with uh, farmers around the world. Yes, that, those were the three elements. Uh, the combining Does those three in a new system was what worked across the board. The actual practices that were used in different places were different, right? You wouldn't use mm -hmm. the same practices in Ghana as you would use in South Dakota because you've got different soil, different climate, you're growing different crops in a different economy with different technological levels of sophistication. But those guiding principles of ditching the plow, covering up, and growing diversity were common throughout the, the farmers who had had really shockingly rapid success at mm. rebuilding their fertility. Very important. If this recipe is followed, does it help retain water in the soil? Yes, that's one of the major benefits of it. Uh, for about every you know percent increase in organic matter in the soil, you can hold another inch or two of water within it. And one of the things that was actually is actually quite surprising is that one of the side effects of using a plow is that you don't get as much water down into the soil. Now you'd think that by breaking up the surface of the land, you would mm -hmm. encourage rainfall to, to run down into the soil. But what you're doing by plowing uh, is breaking up the, the mycorrhizal fungi that partner with plants and that actually create a network of um, fungal hyphae that help hold soil clods together. You're breaking up the worm burrows. You're breaking up the conduits that allow the water to sink into the ground. And so if you have a powdered soil, because you've pulverized it with a plow year after year, what happens the first time it rains is it crusts over and that precipitation runs off over the surface, ends up in the nearest stream with some of that nitrogen that you'd also apply mm -hmm. to the field. It doesn't get into the, into the ground. It doesn't get to the roots where you, as a farmer, you want it. Wow. And so um, it's actually a recipe for drought resilience, which has one of the, been one of the, the attractive facets of this new style of farming that this goes under the sort of label of conservation agriculture. The farmers I visited in South Dakota really liked it because it was resulting in a lot more moisture in their land. And what I'm hearing you say is that worms are good. Oh, worms are great. I mean, there's places where they're an invasive species, but you know, in the general sense, worms are good. And even Charles Darwin even wrote a whole book about <laughs> how, why worms help build soil. And as we come to a close in the show, I got to close with this quote out of the book. The most promising way forward lies in the marriage of agrotechnology and agroecology to rebuild soil fertility. Yes, I mean, that's, that's the vision. And, and you can sort of recast it as thinking about how do you couple the ancient wisdom of crop rotations and a diverse and, and growing cover crops? How do you couple that with the modern technologies that allow us not to till anymore, to solve the ancient problem of soil erosion? And you couple that ancient wisdom with, with our modern technologies, and it's really a recipe for a new way of thinking as we go forward. Dr. Montgomery, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, it was a pleasure.